Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Neil Kashkari. I'm president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and I'm on the board of directors of the Economic Club of Minnesota. On behalf of our board, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our final event of the 2020-21 season, featuring special guest Mary Daly. A quick housekeeping reminder, audience members may use the Q&A button to pose a question during the event today. I'm gonna to be asking some questions of Mary to kick off and then we're gonna to turn to audience Q&A. Please do provide your first name and your company so we know who's asking the question. Mary Daly is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. As a voting member of the Federal Open Market Committee, Mary helped set American monetary policy that promotes a healthy and stable economy. Since taking office in October 2018, President Daly has been committed to making the San Francisco Fed a more community engaged bank that is transparent and responsive to the people that it serves. She works to connect economic principles to real world concerns and is a sought after speaker on monetary policy, labor economics and increasing diversity within the economics field. President Daly began her career with the San Francisco Fed in 1996 as an economist specializing in labor market dynamics and economic inequality. She went on to later become the bank's executive vice president and director of research before becoming president. A native of Baldwin, Missouri, Mary now lives in Oakland, California with her wife, Shelley. And I can just tell you, it's been my pleasure to uh, call Mary a colleague and friend as we've worked together the last few years. And Mary really truly believes in the public service mission of the Federal Reserve. And it's great to have her with us. And Mary, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Oh, it's my complete pleasure. Thank you for so much for having me. I look forward to our conversation. Terrific. Well, I'm going to kick off with some uh, questions. Let's start on monetary policy, which is, I'm sure, top of mind for a lot of our audience. Uh, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Open Market Committee met last week and decided to leave policy unchanged. Mary, where do you think the economy is now? And why did the FOMC decision last week makes sense to you? Sure, that's a, that's a terrific question. So let me start by saying there are really three elements that I want to highlight when we think about the profile of the economy. One is that I think we have a very optimistic outlook. Two is we are a long way from digging out of the hole that COVID co caused. And three, we're not out of the woods yet. So let me start with uh, the first one. You know, as we've got almost 50% of our population in the United States with at least one shot of the vaccine, you've seen this resurgence of activity. I, I sort of characterize it as the freedom induced demand shock. People are finally free, they're vaccinated and they're getting out and they're doing things. And this is really good news for the economy. It spurs hiring, it spurs production. It really puts us in a, a good place to, to launch a, a robust recovery. So that's great. And I, it makes me bullish about the future. The other part, though, that we can never forget and we have to keep in mind simultaneously is that we have a very deep hole to dig out of. COVID was the largest shock in U.S. history, really, to the labor market and to output. And it's going to take some time to get back. And if you want to ever gauge that, just think of there are still eight or 8.5 million workers who had jobs before the pandemic and are now still on the sidelines. And that's going to take some time to clear out. It's going to get some time to re-engage those individuals. And the final piece of this whole economic profile, if you will, is that we're not out of the woods yet. You only have to pick up the news and look at India, look at South Korea and Japan who are faltering on vaccinations for their populations. Look at India who's suffering with, with a terrible loss of life from uh, resurgence of COVID. These are things that remind me that in 1918, I know, Neil, you're a student of history, in 1918, you know, people ran out of their homes when it looked like it was getting better and they had mask burning parties and they paraded around and then the winter came and they had a resurgence that actually ended in a lot of lost lives. So I just think we all need to be patient, realize we're not out of the woods yet, embrace what we've got and recognize we're still a long way to go to recover. And that's why I think Fed policy, the FOMC statement and where we have positioned our policy is perfect because it's outcome based. It says when certain economic conditions for full employment and price stability are achieved, we'll begin normalization. And until then, we're part of the bridge that we're building across the COVID pandemic so that we can bring all Americans through the pandemic and ready to regrow our economy and regain our lives. That's great, Mary. Thank you. A lot of, you know, you touched on the dual mandate, stable prices and maximum employment. Let's start going a little deeper in the labor market. Where do you see the labor market today? 
how are you going to know when we reach maximum employment? And as a labor economist, are you concerned that there might be some permanent scarring from COVID that holds back labor supply? So this is a top of mind question, and I'll just remind everyone, it's always useful that we released a new framework in August of last year, and this new framework was meant to treat a variety of things that we know we're facing going forward, but one of the things that it underscored was the importance of full employment being a broad-based and inclusive goal, not simply one single aggregate like the unemployment rate to tell us the story. The other thing it said is that we're about eliminating employment shortfalls, shortfalls from that goal of full employment. So then the natural question is, what does full employment mean? And I think really it's one of those things where you start with, you know what it's not. 8.5 million people sidelined and not able to have jobs and really re-engage in the activity that they once had, that's not full employment. Not being able to absorb the workers who are coming in, just new graduates from college, all the other workers who had been sidelined and actually getting some of those people who have said, I'm gonna retire back into the labor force if they want to. Those are all what were the goals of full employment. So what I really want us all to think about is Full employment is a moving target. It's something that if we're really generating a, a good economy can actually expand as the economy expands. And we saw this in the last expansion and it relates to your question about permanent scarring. It is so tempting, especially when we want everything to be right and we can just move on and everything's perfect to say that everybody who's off on the sidelines or doesn't have a job, that they don't want one or they're permanently scarred or they can't possibly come back. And that was the narrative for literally millions of Americans who, if not for a strong economy in the last expansion, would have totally been forgotten. But yet those individuals came back to work, they got jobs, they're loyal employees, and importantly, they're loyal members of their community, lifting themselves, their families, and their communities forward. So it is far too early to declare anyone permanently scarred. But I think as a national narrative, the question is, why would we ever think that was true? Why wouldn't we always see the possibility for reinvention and re-engagement if the conditions are right? And that's how I, that's the lens I bring as a policymaker. I want to prove that people can't work, not assume they can't, and make policy that determines that's true. I I, I just say I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I got to tell you that how you said the narrative. Everybody was not everybody. So many people, including me, was saying that because it sounded reasonable back in 2010, 2011, 2012. And just as you said, it was totally wrong. So yep. I mean, I've learned that lesson and I, I really appreciate your comments. Sure, humility but, is an important part of this job, don't you think, Neil? It's just uh, really knowing when you, you don't know and, and changing your mind. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's look at the other side of the dual mandate. Let's look at inflation. So the FOMC statement last week said that upcoming increases in, infl in inflation, which we know are coming because of math, they're likely to be transitory. Are you worried about high inflation and how will you know if high inflation readings are transitory or permanent and should we be worried about a repeat of the 1970s? Okay, so let me start. That's a terrific question. It's actually the question that you see a lot in the news is uh, the idea that there'll be runaway inflation and things. So I, I'd like to start by just putting some things in context. When we're thinking about inflation, uh, these higher readings, the very first thing to recognize is we're thinking about inflation readings of 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, not 13, right? And it, we were completely tolerant of inflation readings of 1.4, 1.5, et cetera, on the other side of two. And so I, I just want to balance our, our risk assessment and say that that same tolerance for 1.5 is something you want to have for 2.5 and in the short term, because these things work themselves out. So now back to the question of, is it transitory or is it more persistent? Well, the transitory part comes from a variety of things that I would call accounting and, and transition dynamics. So the accounting part is that we had low price level readings uh, in the, when we were in lockdown, you know, prices dropped for many items. And when we just roll those months out and we get back to the 12 month math that doesn't include them, then we're gonna end up with just a bump in inflation just from simple accounting. But that doesn't mean that it'll persist. It's a one-time adjustment and then we're through it. The other thing, and I think this is the more salient piece is that we went out in a, with a light switch, right? COVID came, we locked down, demand fell sharply, supply fell sharply, and then we've been fighting the pandemic for so many months, eight, you know, over a year. 
Now with the vaccinations, the economy starting to recover, I called it earlier, this freedom induced demand spurt, we're seeing demand really pick up fast, but we can all go out of our homes and eat at restaurants and do these things and we'll buy things online and shop very quickly, go on vacation, but it takes a while for firms to ramp up their supply. And as a consequence of these transitional dynamics, when we'll see some price pressure because there's a lot of people out there wanting to do something and not all the suppliers are available yet. And that does push prices up. But again, transitory developments that don't actually bleed into the long-term uh, inflation numbers. So that's why I'm on the, um, on, in the camp that this is transitory and also that a little inflation would be a good thing for us. We took over a decade of strong growth in our economy and we never achieved our price stability target. And we recognize by looking at other nations, the challenges that come with never achieving your price stability target. You know, the Japan, Japanese situation is one that's often mentioned, but the EU is struggling with this too. So we don't wanna be in those same problems when we can avoid them. That's the lesson that, that you learn from looking around. And so we're really focused on ensuring we get to price stability and price stability is average inflation of 2% over time. Terrific. Uh, you know, there are two main policy tools that the uh, Federal Reserve is using to support the economy right now, low interest rates, the federal funds rate and quantitative easing. Given that the economy is clearly recovering from the COVID shock, when will it be the right time to stop QE and will that happen before raising the federal funds rate? And so, Neil, I'm going to take this opportunity to just add a third tool that often gets overlooked, I think, by many people. And, and it's just worth noting. So we have the funds rate, as you as you note it. We also have, and it's in the list of uh, tools, it's my second best tool. The funds rate's the first best. The second best is what this concept of forward guidance, telling people what we are going to do and how we're going to think about it, what is often called our reaction function. And then the third one is asset purchases, this um, you know quantitative easing, which can be used both to stabilize financial markets in times of dislocation, but also to support um, accommodative financial conditions like that it's doing now. So when I think of that toolkit, I see that toolkit is very well positioned to meet the needs of the economy we have. And this brings back to the question you asked, which is what's the right time to start thinking about withdrawing that accommodation and what order should it go in? So I think of the right time as when we're much closer to achieving our dual mandate goals than we are now. And when I started, I said, we have an optimistic outlook, a long way to go, and we're not out of the woods yet. And if you apply those things to it, we have an optimistic outlook, but we have only had a couple of months of really good data. And then we extrapolate from that. And I think that's reasonable, but there are wide risk spans around that. And there's also a big hole to dig out of. So we're a long way again from achieving full employment and price stability uh, goals. And so we're, it's not really the right time to start talking about normalization. When we ultimately do, that forward guidance piece is gonna be incredibly important. Uh, the Chair Powell said this the other day, we're going to let people know well in advance so that they're not surprised. That's the lesson we've learned about the importance of transparency. And then I think of bringing our balance sheet, tapering our, our asset purchases before we change the funds rate as just the order of business that we learned from the, the previous times with this and other countries have learned really works the best in terms of, of, of withdrawing accommodation. Largely, I mean, just to say it in my terms, we know the funds rate is our best tool. It's our, the one we have the historically most practice at. It's the one we have the most evidence is the biggest bang for its buck. So I save the best tool as our first tool and I start relaxing the other ones which may have less um, firepower than, than the funds rate adjustment. But again, long way from doing those things. Great, thank you. So let's shift gears. I think we went into monetary policy and the currency of the economy in some depth. Let's turn to the future of work, right? A lot of people are speculating about what does the future look like? You know, as you know, the nature of work has always been changing. And I think the COVID crisis, my opinion, has probably accelerated some of those changes that were already underway. How do you see the future of work? Well, I share your view that the nature of work is always changing. And we were talking about how we could all work remotely, we could telework, but we were thinking it's decades in the future and not uh, tomorrow. And so then COVID came and we realized that these things that we had been talking about as possibilities or high tech firms were doing, but nobody else was, became the norm. And I think this has given us enormous flexibility. 
we recognize that people can be productive and, and beneficial to the firm, to whatever your business line is, when you're in a situation that doesn't have you in a cube in an office at a desk all the time. We've also realized, at least here in San Francisco, at, at our Federal Reserve, that people divide their day differently than we thought they did. They don't have to be so modular where it's work and then it's home and then it's sleep and then it's work that they can do things. They can what we call flex for your life a little bit and that that's a magical power, especially if you have young kids or parents you have to take care of or community um, activities you want to participate in. It, it's really, I think, helped firm shape that we should be output oriented and not time and seat oriented. And I, th I think that's gonna be a, a beneficial piece. The part that's gonna be challenging is not being the humans that we are and snapping back to the inertial way of the, we always like to mean revert, go back to what we know because it's the most comfortable or think that this was an emergency. So maybe it didn't, it wouldn't work as well in normal times. And I think COVID has been a big enough shock and the lessons have been large enough that we'll pull those threads through, but we'll have to be intentional about it and incorporate it into our everyday judgment. And I guess I'll leave with, with this, I'll leave this question with this, that I have learned myself that many more people can be included in this flexibility than I thought. I'll admit, I thought that maybe administrative personnel and other individuals who needed to be answering phones and other things, they should be in the office. And that's just not true. They're just as effective and efficient outside of the office. So I think that's going to be an important lesson. Uh, and I, 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 made, I, I, did, uh, I told you I was going to end, but I'm not. But we're meant to work together. And so we'll be coming back and working at the office and most people will be coming back at some point because I don't want collaboration, idea generation, innovation to suffer. And I think the biggest lesson, and this will be the last thing, Neil, I promise. The biggest yeah. lesson is let's not be bimodal. We either have, all have to be home and remote is the only way, or we all have to come back to where we were and it's, it's people in seats. Let's use this to recognize flexibility counts. And that's the pull through line for the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm, you know, we're wrestling with these same questions here in Minneapolis in our bank. And one thing that's in the back of my mind is, you know, if you give people the flexibility, some are going to work from home more often, some in the office. I could, it's not hard for me to imagine those working remotely saying, hey, I'm not feeling as included as my colleagues are who are there in the office. And, you know, there may be personal trade-offs that people have to make because some of it you can replicate, some of it you can't replicate. And if you want the full experience of, you know, working side-by-side -side with your colleagues, you're going to have to work side-by-side -side with your colleagues. And so I guess my, my overall message to our staff is I want to go slow. And you know, let's let's experiment, let's see what happens, and not like you said, not just pick one of the modal, the bimodal outcomes, and say that's the that's the end all be all. But let's let's related to this, let's talk about education because, in my opinion, education is only becoming more and more important in our knowledge based economy. And you have a non traditional educational path to becoming a PhD economist and Reserve Bank president. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your educational path and then how does that inform how you think about these important policy areas as a policymaker? Well, thanks for the question. So I'll just start with a little background about myself in that, you know, I grew up in a family in Missouri and we lived what I think most people would call in, in my parlance anyway, pretty close to the bone. We were like a, just one economic or health shock away from falling through. And so, of course, we had an economic and a health shock and we fell through and I found myself leaving school, high school at the age of 15, as did my siblings. And I would have been in that situation if not for someone, a mentor nudging me, uh, taking me under her wing and nudging me, get a GED. You know, then I got the GED, she said, get a semester of college, then get a college degree. And then here I am. What's the lesson there? Well, the lesson is there are so many people in our country that walk a tightrope, the tightrope of if they didn't get nudged and go my direction, they get nudged the other way and they fall through. And we leave thousands, millions of people on the sidelines. And then we wonder if they're permanently unemployed, permanently out of, out of uh, the economic mobility that everyone deserves. And I think that's the piece I try to pull through into policy. And it's caused me to rethink something that I held really dear. And also I'll share that with you. So college was transformative for me. 
literally changed my life. It, I went from a narrow world that I grew up in to something that felt like the galaxy to me. It was so big and the opportunities so many. And so I was committed for the longest time to a four-year degree and a four-year time span is transformative. And if you look at the data, it is transformative. But I also recognize that not everybody has that opportunity at any point in life. And we need to, as a, a, a nation, be flexible. Think of education as a lifetime experience. Allow people who have the time and the energy, the equal access and opportunity to get that four-year degree. But if they wanna get a, one semester, let's accredit them. Let's make sure they carry that through. Let's let them divide it out. Let's think rethink education so that you can get a certification after a year, and then you can come back and get the second certification after you've worked a little bit so that we're not, sort of excluding people just because they didn't complete things at the age of 22. I think that's the tragedy of, of some of the things we see in our society is that if you don't do something by a certain time, which is artificially imposed, then you're left out. And I often go back to myself and say, what if I hadn't been lucky? And I was lucky. What if I hadn't been lucky? Where would I be? I'd be in a totally different place. And, and what we really want in our country, I think, well, I know in, in, in this is you want to scale me. You want to have all the people who were like me have the opportunity to be anyone they want to be. Yeah, and, and not have to rely on you finding some wonderful mentor. I mean, it's wonderful that you did. And this, she clearly is- Luck. A, you know, but it's luck. And not every kid's going to have that luck of being able to find that wonderful mentor. So how do you do it? I, I couldn't agree more. I'll give you one example that you just reminded me of, of our own bank. You know, I, I've been here five years. I figured out a couple of years ago that we had an unwritten policy at the Minneapolis Fed that to be an officer, an assistant vice president or above, you have to have a four-year, you've completed a four-year degree. Now we have staff here who've been here for 20 years doing an outstanding job. And we said, well, why do we have that? Why are we going to impose that requirement? We've already seen this person working for 20 years doing an outstanding job. Are we really serious that that's going to be the barrier? So we removed it. And actually, we've had some promotions of really talented people who, who are now officers just because we said, why do we have this artificial barrier? And so I really, I really appreciate your comments. Yeah, that's yeah. terrific. And, and Neil, if I can just pull on this. I mean, you said yeah. it, and I want to just highlight it. Luck shouldn't be the determinant of whether you're successful or not in life. And I think that's where we've left it too much to luck. And then I'm a unicorn and we don't want that. Uh, so I really appreciate that, that call out. And I think your, your center um, that you, you guys are organizing for the system is, is on inclusive growth and opportunity. That's essential. It, it's the building blocks, really. It's starting to figure out how do we take luck out of the equation so that you can just be showing up, doing your work and, and determining, having the agency determine your own destiny. You know, I mean, we're going to go off script here because uh, you and I have not talked about this before, but I think it's fascinating what you just said about luck. What I find in American society is we look at successful people and we say, that person's a genius, and that person's really hardworking. And I agree that talent matters. I agree that hard work matters, but man, luck matters too. And those three components actually work very well together, but we just seem to dismiss it. Every successful person we see, we say, wow, this person's brilliant. And we put them up on a pedestal, ignoring the extraordinary role that luck plays uh, for each of us. Yeah, I completely agree. So I'm an ambassador of the luck proposition because if not for Betsy, you know, on the other side of that tightrope. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me um, stay on this for a second, which is, you know, you talked about uh, becoming a PhD economist and you talked about some of the research you do. And I want to talk about the economics profession because you've done a lot of work on trying to improve diversity in the economics profession. We just had a conference that you spoke at on trying to look at racism in the economics profession and how to bring more diverse economists into the profession. I'm gonna give an observation and I'd love to get your reaction to it. So I'm not an economist, I'm an engineer, and then I went into finance. And I've worked in a lot of high ego fields. Like I started out as an investment banker after business school, right? Investment bankers think they're all geniuses. Then I later after treasury, I worked in investment management. And if the investment bankers think they're geniuses, well, the investment managers think that they're masters of the universe. But man, the economics profession has hubris unlike anything that I've seen before. And it's so plain to me, and it's not all economists clearly, but it's the profession. And it's like, for me, it's how do you explain water to a goldfish? I'm standing outside of the tank. I can see the water clearly. I see the goldfish lives in water. But for a goldfish, 
that was born in water, that lives in water, that is only known water, how do you explain to the goldfish that this water exists? And that's the hubris that I see woven into the fabric of the economics profession that I see as a big barrier to keeping other people out. I'm just curious as an economist, but as somebody who's also working hard on diversifying the field, does any of that resonate with you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the things that I think we have to lean strongly against. And, you know, you mentioned the racism in the economy uh, segment on the economics profession. And we had a guest on this that in, in the panel that I was moderating, Sendel Molly Nathan, also an economist, very well known. And he uh, said this, and I think it's useful to just highlight it. He said that we are uh, social science economists, but we want to be like physics. And so what we end up doing is we really make ourselves so quantified, so quantitative, so special that we end up excluding all voices. And that if we actually opened ourselves to other voices, we would be better. And I completely agree with him. I, I characterized it this way um, so, several years ago when I was giving a speech that we are a profession that invites people to our homes. And you've all met people like this, where you get invited to their home, but then they tell you how you, they, you need to behave to make them comfortable while you're in their home. And that's what economics does. We invite people in and then we say, here are the things you have to do so that we're comfortable. And what it would be better, what it will actually is essential is we invite people into our home and say, how would you change it? Or do what you wanna do and let me see if I learn and grow. And that's the piece that's hard because we have to give up the idea that we wanna be physicists and really lean into the idea that we wanna be social scientists. The economy and economics is about people. We need to study people and study the behavior and the relationships. And to do that, you have to talk to people and you actually have to be influenced by the judgments of others. I, I feel like oftentimes we're wrapped in the prison of our own religion, that we have created this religious order almost, and then it's now become a prison, but we don't even know it is. So one of the things that many of us in the profession, and, and I think it's a growing number, are trying to chip away at is bring other voices in, include them and let them talk to us about letting go of our hubris. Let's actually forget, forget hubris and buy inclusivity. Let's go to that. And if we do that, we will be a relevant profession. Otherwise, we'll end up guarding a castle that no one cares about anymore. That's a great, that's a great analogy. So I've got one more question for you, and I know questions are coming in from the audience, which is, you've been outspoken that the Fed has a role to play in addressing climate change. Not everyone agrees. In fact, some members of Congress have pushed back and said, hey, climate is not in our lane, stay in your lane. I'd just like you to offer your thoughts. In what way is climate change relevant for the Fed? How is it in our lane? Well, this is really important and thanks for the question. And, and let's start with a, a little bit on the, just the language. So we often, you know, climate change is about how the climate's changing and what the remedies might be to, to mitigate that change. And when you talk about that, then you clearly have to have our elected officials who have the allocative responsibilities, the spending responsibilities, think about those issues and they're up to those, those tasks. What we are studying at the Federal Reserve is climate risk. The risk that, that severe weather events and the increasing number of them and the increasing severity of them, the risk that those pose to the economy, to the community, to the financial system and to the payment system. And when you think about it that way, then this is clearly something in our remit. But the natural question is, but this could be very politicized, Mary. So why would you all study this? Well, I wanna just remind everyone that we study trade policy. And before the expansion ended with COVID, there was a, a, a lot of work being done about how the, the trade relations that were deteriorating between the US and China were gonna impact the economy because they were gonna impact supply chains, where supplies are located, um, what the future looks like in terms of free trade, how this was all gonna balance out in the global economy. And we would have been remiss had we not studied those things because they affect the economy, which affects our dual mandate goals and how we fast or quickly we can accomplish them. And so I think if you understand it through that lens, it's easier to say, oh, okay, then climate risk is like trade policy. We don't do the mitigation strategies. We're not engaging in the discussions or debates about how to do it, how to change the climate. What we're doing is saying, this is the world we have. 
And this is the world we need to understand and study if we're going to stay on our dual mandate goals, achieve for the American people what we've been given by Congress to do, and importantly, do that across all of our responsibilities, not just the economy, but also the payment system and the financial system. So it's a, it's a narrow remit, but we would re be remiss not to work in our remit. Great, thank you. All right, we've got some questions that are coming in. So please, uh, if you're watching in the audience, please submit your questions. We've got a few questions already, which I'm gonna start going through. Um, so first question, Mary, this is from Colin at Accenture. Mary, how many, or excuse me, many of our trading partners are behind the US in vaccinations. What impact will that have on our economy? Well, that's a terrific question. It's definitely going to be a headwind because we've seen the impact that the vaccinations have had in the U.S. economy. We can go out more safely and we're not done yet. I want to just underline we're not done yet, you know, less than just about 50 percent of one shot. So we have a long way to go to full um, immunity or full fully putting COVID behind us. But our trading partners are, are far by behind us. And that's going to be a headwind to the US economy. And when I said we're not out of the woods yet, that's one of the factors. We're not out of the woods yet. We could find ourselves with a, a very slow global economy if this vaccination uh, issue doesn't get resolved and, and our global trading partners start to, to get the kinds of improvements we've seen in the US, been fortunate enough to see. And that could be something that's a drag on our, on our growth. So we're in a global pandemic. And until the globe gets a handle on this, then the US economy as, is going to be pushing against that. And we will not grow as fast and we will not be completely uh, behind, COVID will not be completely behind us. And, and I would just add, I completely agree with what you said. I would just add, the epidemiologists also remind us that the longer the virus is spreading around the world, the more opportunity there are for mutations, which could then come right back around uh, on us and hopefully not, but potentially even reduce the effectiveness of our vaccines. And so, you know, I think, I think you're right. You know, related to that, Mary, we're seeing some evidence in the US that vaccine hesitancy, we're starting to bump up against it, right? The daily vaccination rates are actually coming down, which is quite concerning. Because as you said, we saw a lot of Americans who are unvaccinated. If we really do bump up into, let's say, 30, 35% of the population that's unvaccinated and won't get vaccinated, how does that affect our economic outlook? Well, you know, I, I'm going to re say that the epidemiologists are going to talk to us more carefully than I can about herd immunity and what it means. So I won't uh, pretend to be an epidemiologist. That's a hubris I will not take up. But the, the but I will say that we've seen that the vaccination is the safest path out of the virus, and so I would like us maybe to start just by reframing vaccine hesitancy, which I think people think of as vaccine resistance, instead of people are uninformed. We haven't done as much work in, the, in our communities to really inform people about some of their concerns. And so here in Oakland, California, where I live, I heard somebody eloquently put this, no one came to my community and in language I can understand, explained to me why the science was clear and the vaccine was safe. But when, they, when I met somebody who did that for me, then I was among the first in line to get the vaccine. So, so I think it is essential to our economy. It will cause us to lag uh, the growth we could have if we if we fail to get our people vaccinated but it's it's really up to all of us to to not see those people as resistors in, in majority but to see them as people who maybe need a hand up to completely understand why this can be helpful to them their families and ultimately to our economy that's great that's great and you see it's it's very interesting the other piece of this that i'm sure you're watching is how universities around the country are looking at this differently i mean some universities i believe that uh, University of California system has said that they're going to have a vaccine mandate on all their students and staff beginning in the fall. The latest I heard from University of Minnesota was that Minnesota was not yet doing that. But you know that may become a bigger that may become a bigger event around the country as people say, look, we want to reopen. We know in person is important, and so you just got to do it. Right. So, yeah, I agree. It's something to watch. So let's turn another question from uh, Nate at Cargill. Mary, given your background in economic uh, origins, what role do you feel the Fed has in addressing some of the income inequality issues in America, which seems to be only increasing since the financial crisis of 2009? Sure. So, so let me start by saying that, you know, again, we can't, we're just one agency, one institution in the broader economy, and we will not be able to carry all the water to resolve the income inequality 
um, issues that are in our country that absolutely need addressing. But we do have an important role to play. So while we can't do everything, it doesn't mean we can't do anything. And the anything we can do, I would turn back to the previous expansion we just had. So before COVID occurred, we were in going in the, the complete in the 11th year of expansion, the longest in our history. And what we saw in that long expansion is that the gaps between blacks and whites, Hispanics and whites, men and women, all the gaps you could point to, lower, uh, lower education, less education, more education, where you live in the country, rural or urban, they were starting to narrow. That's a great thing. But we had a sustained economy, which allowed people to come in. Those at the lowest end of the wage distribution had the fastest wage growth by the end of the expansion. These are all real positives that I think are part of the Fed's role. Our role is let's keep the economy in a sustained expansion. Let's not pull the punch bowl too far away, too quickly to, to try to ward off some fearful inflation scare. Let's actually stay there until we see what we want to see, which is full employment that causes wages to go for to bid, be bid up. We see the tight labor market show through into prices and we know that we've, we're there. That's something that we can continue to commit to. And if we do that, then we will have done, we've set the foundation. And then of course, the rest of it has to be done with employers. If you're, you know, you're working for a private sector company, employers taking a second look at people that they might think have not had a long enough work history or maybe had some episodic uh, work departures you know, just think of those people as what are their skill sets? Why, you know, do, do what Neil did. Why do we have these, these rules where you can't be a certain thing unless you have this degree? Let's look at skills and abilities. I think those are the things that will help us chip away at this and investing in our people. You know, we have a, we could invest in human capital. Think of that as uh, perhaps our most valuable resource. And that would be something that would make us more globally competitive and really chip away at these gaps. So the Fed has an important role to play, but we're not going to be everything in this story. It's going to take all of us in all of our institutions and in the private sector to really solve these gaps. So related to that, it's a question, a question that I often receive, and I'm sure you've gotten before, is, OK, so the Fed is helping people to find jobs and helping wages to grow, but are, isn't the Fed pushing up asset prices through quantitative easing. And then that, you know, low income folks don't own stocks. So you're really just expanding wealth inequality through your monetary policy. How do you respond to that? Yeah, and so actually I, I gave a speech on this very topic because I, I also think, and, and Neil and I share this, I, I believe we should just talk about things openly. And it is true that when we undertake our policies, they promote a strong economy and a strong economy boosts employment, boosts wages, boosts incomes and asset valuations, houses, stock market, et cetera. And if you own an asset, that's great. But if you don't own an asset and assets are very unequally distributed in our economy, then wealth inequality rises while all these other inequalities shrink. And you see this time and again, that income inequality, wage inequality, consumption inequality, employment inequality, they shrink, wealth inequality rises at the later stages of an expansion. So the remedy for that isn't, in my mind, and I've done a lot of thinking and work on this, it is not to sacrifice wage, wages, income, and employment in order to just save that wealth inequality number from rising, but rather invest in ways where people can purchase an asset, asset uh, purchases more than they have. And so, you know, the best tool that the Federal Reserve has, but we will not, again, not be the whole story, is the Community Reinvestment Act. And you heard, I don't know if you uh, heard it, but Chair Powell yesterday said in his speech, Jay said that you know, thinking about CRA being extended to non-bank financials so that we actually widen the importance of these types of investments in communities and investments in people that allow them to get asset allocation and, and assets so that they can partake in this, right? Whether it's buying a home or buying a stock or being in a retirement fund that goes up when, when asset valuations rise, that's the remedy for equalizing wealth inequality. But again, I won't, I'm not prepared as a policymaker to sacrifice better job growth and better income and wage growth just to keep that wealth inequality number in check, because I think that in the end, if you don't have money, you can't buy a stock. So I'm all about trying to get money in people's pockets and mobility and their future. And, you know, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I, I, I let me just share with you one other comment that I make, 
which is you know the most valuable asset most people have because they don't own stocks or they don't own a house. It's actually their job. Yes. How valuable is a job? So a thirty thousand dollar income job. How many assets do you need to generate thirty thousand dollars of income? At a ten percent interest rate, if you could have find a ten percent yield, it's a three hundred thousand dollar asset. At a one percent yield, it's a three million dollar asset. So by boosting wages, we are actually making the most valuable asset most people have that much more valuable. And most of the wealth inequality analysis ignores the value of somebody's job, which is actually really important. Um, I love that point, Neil. And, and I guess I'm just I'm going to do a call out for why diversity uh, at the FOMC is so important. So you have an investment banking and invest, investment management background. And that's terrific, right? Because it's, it's, it's a hole in the way that many economists do the analysis, not to include the job in the calculation of, of wealth. So uh, I'll just, uh, it's a highlight of why diversity matters, not just diversity of people, but diversity of thought. Yeah, I agree. So we got a question here from Scott at Walrus Partners. It appears that many people will not return to the office at all as the economy recovers. Does the Fed or do you have a view on what that means for long-term occupancy rates and whether many cities now are several years overbuilt regarding office space, leading to a significant slowdown in commercial construction? Well, it's a great question. So I think we can get there without assuming that most people won't come back. I actually think people will come back. Uh, you know, I, I just reflecting on our own teams here, when we surveyed them in the depth of the pandemic, they didn't want to come back. Now, of course, more of them want to come back. And so we're going to end up with people when life resumes in, in a normal way, having probably the desire to stay at home a little bit, work at the office a little bit. So I don't think it's completely no one's coming back to commercial space. And yet commercial space is going to be in a lot lower uh, uh, part of a lot smaller part of the overall portfolio of, of real estate in, the, in cities than it has been before. And I think that this in San Francisco, let me just look through that lens. That's a good thing. So if you're a commercial builder, you just have to switch to being a residential builder. But we have been underhoused and over uh, commercial populated for a long time in most major cities and house prices have risen beyond what most people can afford. There's been people fleeing further and further from the suburb to the suburbs and further and further out commute times have risen. So this can be part of a great rebalancing and recognizing that actually communities thrive when we build residential and commercial sort of together and you have communities that have a variety of different components to the building. So I think it will take a lot of innovation on the commercial uh, builders and commercial real estate holders. And you're already seeing it here in San Francisco, buildings being repurposed for housing and other things. And that's, that's certainly going to be part of the future. And that's, but you know, real estate uh, individuals, this is what I love about them. They have short memories and they, they move towards whatever's going next. And I, and I think that's a good thing. You're gonna have to shake off the, where, the way it was and move forward to the way it's likely to be. And I think it's gonna be a more mixed use um, per, portfolio than it has been in the past. Great, well, let's shift gears. A question that I get frequently, and I'm sure you do, is about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, digital currency, the big news in the past few weeks is that China announced that they're going to issue a, a state government backed digital currency. You want to just give any high level thoughts you have on the sector as a whole, if you have high level thoughts on the sector? Sure. So one thing that I do for myself and I think is useful just to keep doing for everyone is to remember that Bitcoin and a digital currency issued by a central bank are totally different things. So Bitcoin's an asset and many of these things that are called cryptocurrencies are simply assets. And, and they, an asset has the property of, it goes up and down based on demand and supply. If it's a fixed supply and demand goes up, its value rises, but it, it fluctuates. That's completely not a currency. A currency is something that elastically moves back and forth with the economy so that its value isn't affected by the rate of growth in the economy. So then you have to ask, okay, would a digital currency issued by China be preferred to the safe haven asset of the US dollar um, issued by the Federal Reserve. And my assessment is not, no, not right now, because when you're buying a safe haven asset or a safe haven currency, you're really looking for something that you believe in the in all of the rights of that, that it doesn't fluctuate, that it's the rule of law protects it from being changed overnight or you not being allowed access to it. And those are things that historically the US has given. And 
we have not seen China offer those same protections. So I really think this comes down to the same thing it always comes down to, which is people are buying or trading in a currency, not just because of its technological convenience, but because of what it's backed by and the things that they want to do, which is protect themselves, insure themselves, have a safe haven. So I don't think that's going away anytime soon. The final thing I'll say on all of this is, but that's not to say that we shouldn't and aren't looking at it at the Federal Reserve. At the Federal Reserve, we're actively studying these things, actively looking at the convenience factor of a digital currency and the other side of this, which is privacy, uh, fraud, other things that happen. So there's there's got to be uh, two sides, the cost and benefits and finding a currency, a digital one that really works and really it can achieve the things that the US dollar currently achieves, I think is certainly in our future. And you know, when I think about it, and this is such a new area, right? So we're studying it, there's a lot to learn and, and let's see what happens and we can learn from what people around the world are doing. But I always ask myself, what's in it for consumers? And what's in it for the central bank or the government? I'll give you an example. So, you know, digital dollars exist today. I can send you $5 via PayPal or Zelle uh, right now. And so that's a digital dollar. That are, that convenience already exists. So if there was a central bank digital currency, what advantage do you and I, would you and I have as customers? Well, I see it from China's perspective. You know, they can track every dollar that we move and the government wants to do that. They could tax us immediately instantly in our accounts. I see why the government would want to be able to do that. And if they wanted to, they could impose negative interest rates on our accounts if we had a central bank digital currency. So I see the appeal from the government perspective, but as a consumer, that all sounds lousy to me. I don't want the government taxing my account or imposing negative interest rates or tracking every dollar I spend. So to me, this whatever comes from this, it needs to work for both the government and it needs to work for the consumer. They both need to be better off and as yet, I've not heard anybody make the case of why it would work for both. Some, some enthusiasts will say to me, no, 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 you're missing the point. We want an electronic currency that's untraceable, like right. cash. I say, okay, I see why you'd want that. Why in the world would the central bank support that or the federal government support that? And so it needs to work for both. And I've yet to see the case made that it, both sides are actually better off. Yeah. And I think, you know, just a, you know, something that I think is, is, a, is a foot for sure, and will help is this uh, FedNow project we're taking up, which is our real-time gross settlements. What, because one of the things people really want is if I use Zelle or any of these other ones to send you money, there's a, there's a lag. But you, if you have instantaneous clearing that the providers have to share, then I send you something and I get it and you get it immediately and and there's no lag in any of this and, and so that's already the convenience factor that really helps the consumer and solve some of the things that people might want with this digital currency so i completely agree these are this is a two-sided issue and we're really going to have to think through all the care all the things carefully and the technology is evolving as well so more to come on this for sure it's a, it's a good discussion but not one i think will be resolved next year or tomorrow so we had another question here, uh, Mary. Michael from Robbins Kaplan. Uh, the pandemic seems to have further exacerbated gender gaps in the labor market, especially for working mothers. What tools does the Fed have to help address the lack of affordable childcare and other factors keeping women out of the workforce? So our tools are limited in, in terms of addressing those things. We have no policy levers that can address those things. But one of the things that we do in all Federal Reserve banks and the Board of Governors participate in this, we have research that highlights the benefits of one thing over another. And we can talk about, you know, if this many people are not able to work for whatever their barriers are, they don't feel safe to work at, because of health issues, they can't get there for transportation issues, they can't find affordable childcare, so they have a barrier, then that bridles our economy by X percent. And those are ways that we can give voice to these issues and give give facts to these issues, essentially. And then it's up to our fiscal policymakers to decide whether and how to remedy those situations. You know, it's interesting, this topic of uh, affordable child care is interesting because when I got my job, you know, five plus years ago and I traveled around our region, everywhere I went, affordable child care was a, one of the top issues that people raised up. And yet at the same time, if you look at wages for childcare workers, they're generally very, very low. And I was confused by that because if there was really a shortage, I would think wages would be high. So what's going on? So I spent a bunch of time with our researchers 
to try to understand this market. And what I concluded, I'm gonna say this, it's gonna sound provocative, is there's not enough income inequality to support this market. And here's what I mean by that. When you meet people who are expats, let's say they go to the Philippines or they go to India, one of the things they all say is, oh my gosh, it's so great because I can afford a cook and a driver and a housekeeper and a nanny. It's wonderful. Well, how is that possible? Because there's massive income inequality between those expats and then the poor in the Philippines and the poor in India. And here in America, what ends up happening is there's not that huge a gap between the lower income workers and the middle class. And so in, you know, let's, I'll give you an example. If I have to hire a lawyer to write a will, I need four hours of that lawyer's time. So that lawyer can actually make more money than me. That's fine. I can afford that. But in childcare, every hour that I work, I need someone taking care of my children. So it's a, a slice of my income has to go to that person. And so unless there's a big gap between, let's say, the middle class family and the childcare worker, it doesn't make sense. You might as well just stay home and take care of your child yourself. And so that's finally how I got to figure out why are wages so low for childcare workers? And yet so many families say it's still un unaffordable. And then what's the remedy? The only remedy can be through tax policy to try to, to, try to give childcare workers a livable wage, but also make it affordable for families because you're just seeing the private market is grinding because of the, there's not that big a gap in income. So it took me a long time to figure that out, but I think it holds together. Well, I think, you know, it, it, to, to, to pull on a thread there. So if you go to countries like Canada or most European nations, you'll find that there is a publicly provided uh, uh, child care. And the reason they have publicly provided child care or a public program that supports child care, it's similar to what you just said as the remedy, you tax and support. And you do that because you recognize that having people work in the economy is valuable, but having their children also cared for is important. And I, I think we might be at one of those, again, reckoning moments with the pandemic because the, the national child care we have in the United States is the school system. And as soon as the school system sent every kid home, then we realized we had nothing else. And so maybe this will grow something out of that and we'll have something more like a Canadian system or not. That's for the fiscal agents to decide, but it will, it will definitely be, it'll take something like you just said, it'll take a public uh, discussion of this and, and most likely some sort of public provision of this, at least in spirit to get this, uh, to get this done. Because the private sector hasn't been able to solve it and I don't see them solving it quickly. Yeah, so we have another question. We just have a few minutes left. We have another question, Colin from Accenture. There's been a lot of discussion about how rising executive pay has created greater wealth disparity. If, if executive pay were addressed by regulators, how might that impact corporate enterprise value and global competitiveness? It's a big question. So <laughs> I, you know, I think there's a there's just a long study uh, going back 20 years about. So I wanted to move it from executive pay to kind of a winner take all mentality that you have a corporate uh, entity and it has X value. And then you attribute most of that value to the, to the executive and you pay that person out. And that's, that's the winner take all mentality. And I don't think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that that winner take all mentality actually is great for the longevity of the firm. It's really good for shareholder value at a point in time, but maybe not so good at the longevity of the firm. And the, the reason is because if you're in a winner take all and you're really trying to, you're trying to get something in a short term period, you're trying to show value today and you're not thinking so much about value 10 years from that because you don't even know if you'll be there. You might move on and do something else. So I think the way to think about this is to go back and ask, corporations really, and this will be part with shareholders, what do we want? Do we want something that leaves a legacy and that we're building for the future? Or do we want something that we can just consume today, get, and then you know make rich quick and, and move on? And I think changing the way we think of corporations will change how we pay, as opposed to changing how we pay will change corporations. And, and you could go either way, but I, after a long period of thinking about this, much like Neil did on the childcare issue, I've come to, let's change the way we think about our corporate entities and what they're delivering in our society. And pay will change because of that. Pay structures will change because of that. And if we do that, then we'll, we'll find ourselves perhaps with a less, fewer people in the top 1%, but 
re but remember, and I'll leave you with this, that much of the inequality that really is hard is the inequality from 90 to zero. The, the top 1%, the top 10%, yeah, they're they're high and I that's something to address. But there's it's not like it's zero between 90 and and, and the, the lowest percentile. That's a, there's a lot of inequality there as well that is more addressed with education and investment in our people. Yeah, I would say one way that I get at that point is, you know, there's a there, there's a slogan that some people use that I've, I've heard it on Twitter, that every billionaire is a policy failure. And, you know, I look at how lucky we are to have Facebook and Google and Microsoft and all these great company, Apple, that were created in America, most countries would love to have one of those. And yet we have dozens and dozens of those. And so, you know, we certainly need to keep the innovation engine of America going. And then, as you say, use other policy tools to try to make sure that people can fully participate in the economy. So we just have a couple minutes left, Mary. I want to turn it to something uh, maybe a little more lighthearted, uh, just to share a little bit more about you. So you and Shelly, when you know, you're vaccinated now, what are you looking forward to getting back to doing in your personal life that you weren't able to do because of COVID? Sure. So we are going on Friday for the first trip that we've had since the pandemic. And we're going to Yosemite, where mm -hmm. I love just being outside. And because we're vaccinated and the CDC has allowed it, we when we're outside and not around people, we can take our masks off and we can just partake in nature. And I love I love mountain biking, I love hiking, I love golfing, I love traveling, and I can get back to those things. And Shelly and I are just super looking forward to it. But I'll tell you the thing we look most forward to is uh, we went to our first um, socially non-distant dinner in, in two of our, our friend's house on Saturday. They're vaccinated, we're vaccinated, and I got to hug them. <laughs> and just hugging people, being close and connected to people who weren't in my narrow pod of family, that is an amazing thing. So I'll be traveling. And if you see me, I'll be hugging. Yeah, when you're we're going to be getting on a plane this weekend, too, for the first time since the pandemic. We're taking our yeah. kids to, uh, uh, to North Carolina to see my sister and to see my mom, uh, which we're really fantastic. Cool. It's fun, isn't it? It's exciting. Absolutely. Very exciting. So a uh, couple other quick questions just in the moment we have left. Uh, favorite author, maybe, maybe a book you've read lately, recently, and favorite music? Oh my gosh. So I am I love to read, but I don't really ever latch on to a favorite, but I'll just share that I love to read biographies. And uh, the most transformational biographies in my life were biographies of Eleanor Roosevelt. So that I'll leave you with. So it's not really an author. It's just that my favorite books are biographies. And she was the first person I ever read a biography of. So I fell in love with it and I've read everyone since. So that wow. that's that. And music, I like all kinds of music, but Shelly and I have uh, a nightly uh, sing-off where we, well, we're doing the dishes and cleaning up after after dinner. We, we put on some music and we sing. So the only requirement we have in our house is we have to be able to sing badly to it. Oh, that's great. That's great. So I'm not going to ask you if you want to demo right now, we'd be happy to take it, but I'm not going to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no demos. <laughs> okay. Well, Mary, this was a wonderful discussion. On behalf of the Economic Club of Minnesota, I just want to thank you. Uh, you're a terrific uh, speaker and you've got a lot of great ideas. And so I just want to thank you for taking the time to share with us uh, all of your ideas. Complete pleasure, Neil. Thanks so much for having me and to the club for having me. Absolutely. And so this is our final event of the season. Uh, please watch for special events that are going to be happening between now and our season opener in September. And keep up to date by visiting us on, face, uh, on our website and following us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.